Devices in modern power systems have started to become smarter and smarter, and at this point they can almost all talk with each other in one way or another. This sort of communication is extremely important in turning a bunch of disparate devices into a fully integrated system. The main goal of this video is to be an introduction, serve some background, and frame in the discussion around industrial communications. While there's certainly too much to discuss for one video, we'll set the stage for what protocols we use today and why we use them, and then give general guidelines for what you'd expect to see where. Ready? Every device, be it a breaker, a meter, a PLC, or something else, will have a specific way it prefers to talk, or a communication protocol. Understanding how to network two devices is key to building a system, so let's cover some of the basics. Communication protocols are sort of like languages. They each convey information differently, and if you want to pass information between two devices, they must speak the same language. Some devices only speak one language, some devices speak multiple. A lot of these protocols used to be proprietary by company. This made it difficult to get systems to cross-talk to each other to the detriment of the end user. This changed in 1979 when Modbus was published as the first openly available communication protocol to help standardize the controls industry. Since then, open publishing has become standard for new protocols and given rise to a variety of dialects. Now, before we mention specific protocols, we also have to consider the hardware. Protocols are just standards for encoding and transmitting data signals. Physical connections like adapters, cords, and ports are the actual wires that carry the signals. In a transportation analogy, protocols are the modes of transportation, like car, bus, truck, or motorcycle, and physical connectors are the infrastructure to travel along, like roads, sidewalks, alleys, or highways. There are sets of advantages and disadvantages for any choice, and it's up to the system designers to choose the best combination for the job. Some common communication cables you've probably seen before are RS-232 and DB9, but these are being steadily replaced by Ethernet due to serial protocols being gradually phased out and replaced by Ethernet protocols. However, there's still a healthy amount of each type, and it can be helpful to get an idea of how a system works merely by looking at what physical connections are in use. There are three main hardware methods that communication protocols use to transmit data. Field bus, Ethernet, and wireless. Protocols in each category share similar characteristics. Field bus protocols talk over a shared communication bus, Ethernet protocols are generally carried out across much wider networks, and wireless communications operate via transceivers. Let's get into more detail. Field bus can be physically implemented with two wires, usually referred to as a twisted pair. As a serial connection, field bus protocols send bits, or the smallest unit of data, one at a time, quite literally bit by bit. This method is advantageous because the twisted pair makes communication robust to noise, and the simple transmission scheme means that information can never be received out of order. This makes it a good option for sequence-dependent processes. Additionally, multiple devices can link together on the same bus through a process called daisy chaining, which doesn't require any extra hardware, making it especially lightweight, only requiring two wires. The disadvantages are that field bus communications are mainly suited for wiring between two devices directly, known as point-to-point -point application, and the bit-level transmission makes overall network speeds relatively slow. Both reasons make it difficult to scale a system to hundreds of devices, but still most legacy systems use field bus since it's cost-effective and easy to set up and maintain. Modbus RTU, Profibus, and CAN bus are three protocols that make use of field bus twisted pair connections. Modbus RTU is extremely basic. It's only about passing bit information like mentioned before, so it's the easiest to implement. However, that also means that it only has basic capabilities like reading and writing values, and it has very limited diagnostic and control capability. Profibus, or Process Field Bus, is a newer, more capable implementation. It's faster and has dedicated handshake procedures, making it able to handle more devices effectively. This makes it much harder to set up and requires domain-specific knowledge, but the result is an extremely effective protocol that serves as the backbone for most industrial automation systems. Finally is CAN bus, or Controller Area Network, which is a field bus protocol specialized for vehicle and individual equipment use. It focuses on providing fault-tolerant communications as well as diagnostic capabilities between a smaller network of devices, both of which are necessary in harsh mobile environments like cars. Ethernet transmission is newer and more advanced than field bus and other serial methods, so it has a lot of advantages. This includes speeds that are multiple orders of magnitude faster than field bus, as well as super long distance communication. Inside a cable and the familiar RJ45 connector are eight signal conductors, which traditionally are in four twisted pairs. Interestingly, for anything under gigabit speeds, only two of these pairs are actually used. In more modern applications, fiber optic cables can be used in place of the twisted pairs, offering even faster speeds and noise immunity. 
The major differences, though, between Ethernet and Fieldbus is how data is sent. Rather than transmitting information bits one by one, Ethernet sends standardized frames, or packets, that can each contain up to 12,000 bits. This sort of information density is suitable for creating networks on which many, many devices can all communicate with each other, either on a local area network or a wide area network. The disadvantage is that Ethernet can't be daisy-chained and requires extra ports to interface, and the extra cabling and support hardware, like network switches, make it much more expensive to implement. Also, due to differing packet sizes and transmission distance, in rare instances, packets might be transmitted out of order, which can cause serious problems. However, due to how extensive modern information networks are, we still use Ethernet in the vast majority of cases. The most common Ethernet protocols in industrial communication systems are Modbus TCP IP, or TCP for short, Profinet, and Ethernet IP. Modbus TCP and Modbus RTU are cousins. They work off the exact same protocol operating principles, but with Ethernet transmission, Modbus TCP can now send significantly more data much faster. Where Modbus RTU is suitable for device-to-device -device connections with simple data dependencies like breaker to relay, Modbus TCP is much more useful for pulling lots of data from lots of devices. Therefore, it's much more suitable for connecting higher level devices like PLCs to meters or other PLCs. Still though, Modbus is known as a half duplex protocol. All connected devices can both transmit and receive, they just can't do both at once. On the other hand, stepping up from Profibus to Profinet does change duplexity. In addition to the faster speeds and improved connectivity from Ethernet, Profinet is full duplex, which means that all connected devices can transmit and receive simultaneously. This can significantly improve system speeds and precision and makes it possible to manage complex network topologies with multiple controllers interlocked with each other. Profinet is more common in Europe, but in North America, you're more likely to come across Ethernet IP. They have very similar performance and use cases with a couple key differences. Profinet actually manages to resolve the pack rate asynchronicity problem mentioned before, whereas Ethernet IP doesn't. This precision difference might matter in the most complex environments, but where Ethernet IP shines is its flexibility and accessibility. It's much more open source, and a lot of components are available off the shelf. This level of standardization means that it's incredibly easy to build, develop, and modify Ethernet IP systems. If you've ever set up your home router, then in fact you've done this too. It's worth noting that in some North American industrial environments where precision matters more, there's another variant called EtherCAT that uses a unique clock and distribution system that allows for faster, more precise operation. Finally, we have wireless communication, which can take the form of any transmitter and receiver, like cellular, satellite, etc. Many residentially familiar protocols exist, like Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, and Zigbee. However, there's been difficulty adapting them to industrial use, where speed, precision, and reliability cannot be compromised. There are many different options, but they'll almost always be limited to lower power, less critical applications. One niche that wireless communications have found great success in is with utilities. The main communication protocol in these cases is DNP3, or Distributed Network Protocol 3. Originally, DNP3 was designed for wired TCP IP, but it also particularly suits the needs of utility companies, who would have thousands of distributed meters and require low frequency sampling. Geographically, utility equipment may be spread across thousands of miles, so running physical wire isn't always feasible. To make the process more efficient, these setups are typically installed as mesh networks, meaning that one master station sends commands to several surrounding stations, who can in turn relay that message to further stations down a distribution tree. Secondly, utility communications are more focused on metering, leaving the device level automation to handle any system faults. This means that latency isn't as much of an issue, and oftentimes demand data may only be pulled once per 15 minute window. For actual system automation, sites will use local wired communications to ensure that nothing goes wrong, and wireless communications can be reserved for remote monitoring. These are core concepts in supervisory control and data acquisition, or SCADA schemes, in which one site oversees a large network of others. Although there's no ironclad rule on what devices use what communications, understanding the advantages of each protocol like this gives a general guideline for what to expect. Fieldbus is lightweight, cheap, and robust to noise, making it ideal for ground-level devices that don't do much onboard processing, like breakers or variable frequency drives. Ethernet, with its high speed and information density, is more effective at high volume traffic, like data from power quality meters or instructions from PLCs. These differences highlight an important idea. Unless you have a very small system, it'd be very rare to use only one type of communication protocol. Many devices will be able to support multiple protocols, enabling you to make a hybrid system. You could use Modbus RTU at the distributed device level for its simplicity and cost, 
and then link PLCs together on an Ethernet network to process data and manage the entire facility. The lower level devices might also even have Bluetooth interface to make user operation friendlier. If we ever need to interface two devices that don't use the same communication protocols, there are dedicated devices called gateways that serve to translate for the two. As a final note, we'll touch on security. Cybersecurity is an extremely important topic nowadays, especially as systems are becoming both larger and more critical. Though we're seeing less and less, field bus and serial communications will likely never be phased out entirely due to their simplicity. Since they require physical device-to-device -device connections, they're actually able to form very secure closed-loop networks. It'd be very difficult to remotely influence them without being physically present to tamper with the cables and equipment themselves. Although Ethernet has speed and distance advantages that let it set up massive networks, this also introduces risk. More devices equals more vulnerabilities, and a remote connection to a single unsecured device could have the potential to damage an entire network, which could affect millions of devices. Eaton proudly collaborates with UL to develop testing requirements for listings like UL 2900, a new certification for setting cybersecurity standards. Additionally, all relevant products align to IEC 62443 standards in order to pass on ease of mind to customers as we push technology forward. That was a lot of information, so let's quickly summarize the key points. Fieldbus and Ethernet are the two primary platforms that communication protocols are built off of. Fieldbus is a methodology that's lightweight, cost-effective, robust, and secure, making it suitable for low-level devices like breakers. Common Fieldbus protocols are Modbus RTU and Perfibus. Ethernet, on the other hand, can handle large quantities of information very quickly, so it's more suited for higher-level devices like controllers. The most common Ethernet protocols are Profinet and Ethernet IP, though there are a lot of different options available. To learn more about communications and see them implemented in real systems, contact us or your local Eaton representative to schedule a visit to one of Eaton's Power Systems Experience Centers today.